Welcome back to The Gallant Goblin, where today we look at a new D&D 5e campaign book on Kickstarter and build one of its adventures with minis and terrain. First, a thank you to our sponsors, The Big Bad Booklet from The Deck of Many. Click the link in the video description below to check it out. And the Roll for Combat actual play podcast for Pathfinder and Starfinder, also linked in the video description below. So today we have something new and exciting. A lot of folks have asked us to show how to build scenes from campaigns and one shots. And today we're featuring Adventures from the Pot-Bellied Kobold, which is currently on Kickstarter. It's an anthology of adventures by many of the most talented writers in D&D today, including James Intracasso, a lead designer at Matt Colville's MCDM Products, Hannah Rose, a longtime writer and editor for Wizards of the Coast, and Mike Shea, aka Sly Flourish known for his Lazy Dungeon Master series. The project is led by Jeff Stevens, a prolific publisher on DMs Guild, the official Wizards of the Coast marketplace for D&D supplements. And thank you to Jeff for providing a sample for us to look at. Note that we received a preview of the product with no strings attached. All comments in this video are mine and not sponsored. There are 15 adventures total in the anthology. They're short, functioning as one-shots or encounters that add variety to an area or work as a side session. The adventure we're covering today is on the short side of the four sample adventures provided in the press copy, but is otherwise reasonably representative of the scope of story a given adventure tells. Each entry in the anthology is self-contained, mostly set in one area for which a key location is illustrated with a full color map. There's also additional custom art to illustrate objects, locations, and characters from the story. Those who have Kobold Press's Tome of Beasts and Creature Codex books are given options to add stat blocks from those into the adventures, but otherwise the free 5th edition D&D basic rules, and we provide a link to that document in the video description below, are all you need to run this product. For those who want to maximize their use of the book, there is an optional overarching plot that can tie all the adventures together. That storyline revolves around, you guessed it, the pot-bellied kobold, who is actually a gnome named Chrysaly Tingletoe, transformed by a curse placed upon her by her rival, the evil wizard Belisana Bane. Chrysalie travels with a beautiful customized wagon to protect her from her newfound sensitivity to sunlight, and you can use her in your campaigns as a traveling merchant, a scholar knowledgeable about the area, or the quest giver for this book's campaign arc, which is to undo the curse that transformed her into a pot-bellied kobold. So let's dive on into our sample adventure called Two Heads Are Better Than One by Hannah Rose. Note that there are spoilers ahead, so if you're planning to be a player, you may need to jump over to another video. Okay, I'm going to assume if you're watching past this point, you're good with some spoilers. So this is a map of Auburn's Cave, former home to the possibly talented, but definitely not sensible, elven mage, Alburn. And this is our basic Dwarven Forge Caverns deep build before minis and set dressing. Alburn was kicked out of his academy for necromancy and took up residence in these caverns to build a zombie Etten out of an ogre body and an extra head, which I don't think that's how that works. As might be expected, his monster killed him. Can your party of adventurers stop this undead terror, or will they be its next victims? The book provides multiple story hooks for bringing a party to the cave. They're kept generic so that you can place the cave in any region where such a story makes sense for your campaign. The book also encourages you to rename or retheme locations as appropriate, really reinforcing that its primary purpose is as a flexible tool set for enhancing your games. As for building the location, don't despair if you don't have Dwarven Forge. We'll cover other terrain options at the end of the video. You may have also noticed that our build is only partially painted. That's because we bought the pieces unpainted, which is a more budget-friendly option, and Theo hasn't painted them all yet. If you're looking at getting Dwarven Forge, they have excellent painting guides online, and pieces like caverns are relatively simple to paint, so it's an option to consider. It also gives you options on how to paint your pieces. For example, Dwarven Forge has instructions on how to paint the cavern pieces as either regular caverns or icy frost caverns. In this case, however, you could also get away with saying that these unpainted pieces are gray because the caverns are dark and you're seeing it through dark vision. 
The adventure is divided into five sections consisting of four caverns and one passageway. While we've built the whole map at once, doing so isn't necessary. If you don't have enough pieces, you can modify the build in the following ways. First, room four has no combat in it, so there's really no need for a grid. You don't have to build that. Second, the rooms are largely modular, so you could take apart one room and build the next as you go. This isn't highly desirable as it can take quite some time. Finally, you could just build one cavern to represent all of them. If you want some diversity between the rooms, adjust the scatter terrain, or add or remove floor pieces to shrink or expand the cavern size without changing the overall shape of the room. All told, this full build requires about, and I'll explain why I say about in a moment, 25 regular floor pieces, which are two inches by two inches, one entrance piece, which I like because it's a narrow five foot corridor with these ominous jagged rocks lining the passageway, but is really otherwise optional. Uh, 44 wall pieces, which look like this, and they have essentially a two inch, well, here we go, a two inch by one inch strip of terrain attached to a two inch by one inch wall. You'll also want about five freestanding walls like these with no terrain, with no terrain attached. Um, and that's so that you can place them on some of these regular floor tiles with no walls on them and in order to close off some openings. Finally, because this, pass this adventure likes to have uh, narrow passageways, you'll also want some of these two, one inch by one inch floor tiles. You'll want two of these at least, and two of the one inch by one inch walls attached to floors to fill in some gaps in those funnel areas. We also used two special pieces for the doors, but you can instead leave those walls open and put a set dressing door from another product on there, like from Terrain Crate or Warlock Tiles. So now back to that about statement for the piece counts, because Dwarven Forge sells terrain in packs. So depending on what you get, you may end up short some types of tiles, but have extras of others. In the case of this build, there were situations where I combined a floor tile and a standalone wall because I didn't have a floor wall combo piece available. You may also need to do that if you want to get a more irregular wall shape, but don't have the right pieces for it. So Dwarven Forge does have what they call trifecta pieces, which are freestanding floor and wall pieces with irregular shapes that combine together, letting you get those more interesting shapes. But you may not always have those on hand. Alternatively, if you do, you can use those to save up on your more bread and butter pieces. Finally, Dwarven Forge sells tiles bigger than 2x2, such as 4x4, and if your pack comes with that, they're great to fill in the center of a large space, which we did here in that last cavern. But let's populate these caves and take a look at the adventure itself. Area one is a cavern filled with bone piles, but they're not just there to create an ominous atmosphere. They're actually skeletons that rise up if disturbed. Skeleton minis are pretty common, so you have a lot of options. Reaper Miniatures has a pretty comprehensive set of unpainted creature skeletons for different animals, monsters, and humanoids. Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures has an unpainted skeleton pack from Wave 1. On the pre-painted side, WizKid's Icons of the Realm's Tomb of Annihilation set has numerous skeleton sculpts, as does Pathfinder Battle's Ruins of Last Wall. And the March 2021 Icons of the Realms release is called Boneyard and focuses on undead creatures. So we don't know what's in that set at the time of this recording, but that may be something to look at as well. Bone piles, which form the skeletons, are actually harder to find, though. WizKids did produce one in Wave 6 of Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures. Alternatively, you can do what we did and substitute in dead bodies from the Halister's Lab premium set that accompanied D&D's Dungeon of the Mad Mage, or from the Ruins of Last Wall set for Pathfinder Battles. Now, the adventure calls for 10 skeletons, with modifications if your average party level is above or below the recommended level. And this is where I'd argue that DM discretion is important in designing a battle map. As drawn on the map in the adventure, there's about 33 free squares. I'm not counting ones partly cut off by walls. Using the same counting method on my Dwarven Forge build yields 29 spaces. Most D&D parties have four to five characters, not counting pets, familiars, sidekicks, etc. So you're looking at every other square in the room filled by either an ally or a foe. 
That's really crowded, and that's fine. The design clearly intends the party to be swarmed, especially since options are provided to avoid combat altogether by sneaking past the skeletons without rousing them. Nevertheless, it's also worth noting that the text of the adventure describes the cave as 40 feet in diameter, so assuming it's roughly round, that would actually yield around 40 to 50 playable squares. So the map in the book shows a smaller playable space than the text arguably calls for. This isn't a criticism, and I really don't know which size is the intended version, but it's worth noting and becomes especially obvious when you have a physical build and a bunch of minis all crowding together in a small space. All of which is a long way to say that you should treat these maps as guidelines and feel free to expand or shrink spaces as makes sense to you. You're the DM, so you have the final say on tuning the adventure. Personally, I'd recommend expanding this first cavern to around 40 tiles if possible, just to give folks a little room to maneuver. Area 2 is a narrow passageway filled with mushrooms that emit clouds of poison if disturbed. Now, obviously you don't have to represent every terrain feature on your build, but some cavern's deep pieces do have little mushrooms painted on them, which can be good for this adventure. The text says there are, quote, small clusters of pale gray mushrooms on the walls and floor. Caverns Deep also comes with these large mushroom features for the mushroom grotto, and they can come in handy as markers. If characters disturb a mushroom, it creates a poison gas cloud in a five foot square that lingers for 10 minutes. If that happens, these mushrooms, which occupy a one inch grid or five foot square, are perfect for indicating which squares have been poisoned by the mushrooms. The Pathfinder Battles Maze of Death set also has the Mind Frond and Purple Fungus minis, which can also be used as tokens. Now once your characters have squeezed through that fungus funnel, they enter Area 3, which is another cavern with several notable features. First, there are two ogre zombies eating a live skeleton. I mean, undead skeleton. Anyway, they're all very happy to see you because the ogres have something fresh to eat and the skeleton stops getting eaten. For minis, wave 12 of Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures includes an ogre zombie, but it's unpainted. There's no pre-painted version at the time of this recording though, so if you want a pre-painted figure, you'll have to use a regular ogre mini as a stand-in. As usual, you have unpainted ogre options in the WizKids and Reaper product lines as well. For pre-painted ogres, you have options on the D&D side in Elemental Evil, Volos and Mordenkainen's Foes, and the fixed monster pack set called Cave Defenders. On the Pathfinder side, you have ogres in Heroes and Monsters and Rise of the Rune Lords. The other notable feature in this area is a wooden door. You're getting close to Alburn's workspace and he needed some privacy, or, you know, a barrier between him and ravenous ogre zombies. The details of what are in this room are story spoilers, so we won't cover them here, but suffice it to say that the Halister's Lab premium set goes well here. There's a number of tables, crates, benches, and a chest, and you can throw in some additional set dressing that befits a wizard's laboratory. This is a necromancer's workspace, so it should be a little gross. Feel free to throw in some bones, meat, barrels of questionable goods, and half-melted candles. For the most part, what you see in our build is a combination of the Halister's Lab premium set and the Dungeon Dressings expansion pack from Warlock Tiles. And now we get to the final confrontation. My build here is actually larger than the adventure specifies, mainly because I ran out of 2x2 two two tiles and had to use some bigger pieces. That's also why there's this giant terrain piece in the back, which has nothing to do with the adventure, but makes a convenient wall. You gotta do what you gotta do. In terms of minis, I used the Etten from Elemental Evil. There's also an unpainted Etten in the Nolzers line, which is a different sculpt, and as well as in other product lines. Finally, you also have the body of Alburn himself, which is relevant for spoilery reasons. Any human spellcaster figure would work, and while there is a Necromancer mini, it seems a bit too fancy for Alburn. I personally favor using Hamet Shaw from Monster Menagerie 1. He's a Necromancer from the Sword Coast Legends game and looks the part of a bedraggled young wizard. And then, of course, once our heroes have resolved the zombie Etten and Alburn's fate, there's one more teeny tiny five-foot corridor through which they can exit the cave. 
The adventure also contains a variety of rewards you can find or earn along the way, as well as at least one big decision at the end that could impact the region. All in all, it does everything you'd want a short adventure to do. It's easy to run, but has a lot of variety in the encounters and monsters. It's a simple story, but has a mystery and a build-up to a satisfying conclusion. And it's flexible so that it can serve a broader story, be a simple one-off dungeon crawl, or let you insert your own story hooks and elements. The other adventures in the book span a variety of scenarios and locations, so taken together, it's a great collection and tool set. If you're interested in picking it up, go back Adventures from the Pot-Bellied Kobold on Kickstarter before it ends on Friday, November 6th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific time. It looks like it should fund, and the project team is definitely reputable. When it's done, it should release on DriveThruRPG.com with both PDF and print-on-demand options. Now, I know I promised you other terrain options, so here we go. If you're watching this in the far future, assuming nothing strange has happened, WizKids should have a tunnels and cave set of pre-painted Warlock tiles terrain releasing mid-2021. Otherwise, there's actually a lot of great 3D printing options for cavern sets. You can search for various pieces on sites like Thingiverse, which also has a nice mushroom model linked in the video description below. But Principal Scenery, creators of the Open Lock Terrain System, ran a Kickstarter last year for a setting called Chlorhaven. Chlorhaven is a town setting, but the same Kickstarter had the Goblin Grotto, which comes with an incredible looking collection of cavern pieces. You can learn more about that in the links in the video description below as well. So hopefully this was an interesting look at building out an adventure with terrain and minis, as well as how you can improvise with the pieces you have. What do you think of the build? What would you have done differently? And would you like to see more videos like this in the future? Let us know in the comments down below. Before you go though, I wanted to share something super exciting and also terrifying. I will be participating in a show on the official Dungeons & Dragons Twitch channel this Friday, October 16th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You can find a link in the video description. The show is called Design Dash, and if you're familiar with Iron Chef, it's like that, but for D&D adventure designers. I'll be a contestant alongside the very talented Brittany Hay and David Markuski. We'll be given a prompt when it starts and have 15 minutes to come up with an adventure using it. In my experience as an audience member, these things are always chaotic, zany, and tons of fun. So if you want to see me panic and flail for an hour while hopefully creating something cool, come check it out this Friday. It should be lots of fun, and you'll also get to vote on Twitter once it's over to determine who returns next month. I want to thank our sponsors for this video. Roll for Combat is an actual play podcast officially licensed by Paizo, which is embarking on a new Pathfinder adventure called Agents of Edgewatch, where the group plays a group of City Watch members who have to thwart a conspiracy in the great city of Absalom while doing good and staying on the right side of the law. It's tightly edited and a great look at how Pathfinder 2nd Edition plays while telling a great story full of role-playing and memorable characters. Listen today on your podcasting app of choice or on RollForCombat.com. And thanks as well to our friends at the Deck of Many. The Big Bad Booklet series is a monthly zine about boss monsters for 5th edition D&D. The booklets detail boss monsters for you to use in your adventures with stat blocks, lair information, new mechanics, minion stat blocks, story hooks, role playing guides, and everything you need to run a fun session or mini campaign with your gaming group. This month, come meet Gix, a giant vulture with a habit of collecting the bones of legendary heroes. Will your skeleton end up in his sprawling ossuary? Find out by subscribing today at BigBadBooklet.com. Thank you for watching again today. Don't forget to check out the Kickstarter if this video piqued your interest. And if you enjoyed the video, you can help us out by clicking the thumbs up button, subscribing to the channel, and joining us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We always welcome your suggestions and feedback. This video wouldn't have come about if not for your input. So let us know what you think and what else you'd like to see. Please feel free to reach out to us in the comment section down below. Otherwise, hopefully, I'll see you at the Design Dash this Friday, as well as next time at the Gallant Goblin. <laughs>